very unique member here of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Unique in the sense that uh, he saw the B-17s from the underside. And this is uh, November 30th, year 2001. And it's my privilege to uh, welcome Carl here and to be interviewing him this morning. And he'll be telling you about the uh, artillery piece, anti-aircraft piece, the, the 88 that he was a uh, crew on, as well as uh, his experiences there during the war and uh, his experiences here in the United States since then. So Carl, it's really good to have you here this morning. Uh, it's good to be back after a year and a half. I have started working here half a year before the museum opened and worked here for three and a half years, every Monday, all day. I notice you're a member of the Confederate Air Force, too. <laughs> okay, let's, to begin with, let's go back. Your childhood began um, in, in the province of Bavaria there. And uh, tell us, I guess what everyone's kind of interested in is comparing your upbringing and your family life to what it's like here. I was born in a little town called Erding, which is about 20 miles northeast of Munich. And about 1935, they started building an army, not an army, an air force base there. As a matter of fact, I remember the first two planes that landed on a swampy field. They were biplanes then, Stieglitz, but I don't know who made them. And then about a year later, they worked pretty fast at that time. They had the air force base there. And in 1938, my dad was transferred to Munich to work with the fire department and I grew up as much as I ever grew up <laughs> in Munich and uh, went to school in Munich and in 1943 they were looking for volunteers for anti-aircraft and I figured this is a hell of a lot better than going to school so we had our physical, and on the 2nd of January of 1944, I marched my well, about two or three miles out to the battery, and I was a Luftwaffenhelfer, which is an Air Force helper. Actually, it is Air Force Weapons Helper, which is a terrible translation, but that's what it means. We were an auxiliary outfit to the Air Force. We were not under martial law. We were basically Hitler Youth. That's how they kept it, but we never saw anybody from the Hitler Youth out there. They were sitting around offices in Munich. <laughs> well, I guess what I would be interested in, as well as the other people that are going to be viewing this, because that 88 is probably the most famous or well-recognized artillery piece. It was very II. effective, yeah. And we know There's it no was, good gun, but it's an effective gun. <laughs> we know it was very effective. Uh, tell us what you know about that. And, well, again, I couldn't find the book at home because it, at my age I forget everything. And I just organized it about half a year ago. But basically it was manned by, I guess, nine people. We had the K-1, which did the elevation, the K-2, which did the sideways movement, the K-6, who determined the length of the time the projectile took until it exploded, then you had the loading gunner, you had the battery, not the battery, but the, the gun chief, who was usually a non-com officer, usually an unteroffizier, who I guess would be a sergeant here. And then you had about six people that carried ammunition. We were stationed outside of Munich, north of Munich, in Obergrashof, between Dachau and Schleswig. Dachau, of course, is known to most Americans. Yeah. Schleisheim is not. It was the first Royal Bavarian Air Force Base in 1902, I guess, and eventually ended up a night fighter training base. And we were located between the two areas. What was your job on the crew, Carl? I was the K-1, the elevation thing, and then in June I switched to the switchboard because I was in a hospital with rheumatism and I was out for a while and I came back and I figured I wasn't good enough, in good enough shape to handle the gun. So 
they put me behind the switchboard. I didn't take a hell of a lot of talent to shoot that gun because as we will see later on they have an arrow moving around and you match your arrow with that arrow and that's it. All the information comes from a rangefinder. Rangefinder is the same thing that they have on ships, big beam about 16 feet wide lenses on each side and they would figure, zoom in on the airplane or airplanes, we never saw one, we saw a few hundred every time. And then they send the signal to the gun and all you had to do was match up the arrows. What was the range, maximum range? Uh, we could go to 30,000 feet but we weren't accurate until about 24 or 25,000 feet and that was about it. Which was fine because most of the B-17s came in about 20 to 24,000 feet. We could fire, depending on the strength of the loading gunner, about 24, 26 rounds a minute. How, how big is a round? Uh, what did it weigh and what was the strength? Uh, the shell weighed about 30 pounds and I always thought of it as a five inch gun. It, I measured it yesterday and took my ruler out and it's only about a three and a half inch caliber. The 88 millimeter though. Uh -huh. Now they use those uh, anti-tank guns too with a different projectile. I different projectile. They had a, I guess a delayed fuse and they would go through the armor and then explode. And for anti-tank pretty much the same stuff that we use in anti-aircraft. They would just explode and make a mess out of you. Now you told me earlier that you read that they only made 3,000 of those? Yep, and I'm still trying to find where, where I found that, but it was a, a publication somewhere over here. Well, we had a double battery, so we had, north of Munich, we had 16 guns. We started out with eight, and they beefed up on it. Munich only had about five of those locations all around town, that was it. So there would have been less than a hundred guns in Munich. And most cities in Germany weren't protected by anti-aircraft, you know. We had to protect Munich, not Munich itself. There was a BMW factory, there was a locomotive factory, and there was also a factory that built the engines for the, the BMW engines for the Junkers airplane, so but an important place. But if there are only 3,000, it tells me that, that there weren't too many lost either. No. Well, in the, they, they took those things out. Now the gun down here is on wheels. Ours was mounted in concrete and recessed in, in the earth. About, we were about three feet down and then we had a wall around it about two feet high so you could stand on your seat and look out, but you couldn't look out if you were handling the gun. Were you ever targeted uh, by the B-17? Just once, which was sort of strange. Maybe they were afraid of us, maybe we weren't important enough, whatever the case was. Uh, <laughs> well. But they, they did lay one, what we call a bomb teppich, uh, aerial bombing type thing. And they started out, oh, maybe three quarters of a mile away and came within about 300 feet. And we figured that isn't long enough, we won't get it that time. But we were shook up pretty good, we were in a swampy area and the, the ground bounced around quite a bit, so. Well, that's, that's interesting. Uh, very interesting. Anything else you want to say about the, about the, <coughs> the 88? We'll, we're going to go outside later on and take pictures Yeah, one of thing I mentioned, we had, you know, people who handled the gun and then the, the ammunition carriers, and we had, at least for a while, Russian POWs who handled the ammunition. And after a couple of raids, one of the guys got smart and says, well, the Geneva Convention doesn't allow POWs to be in war activity. <coughs> and our lieutenant says, well, you Russians, you never signed the Geneva Conventions to get the hell out of here. <laughs> So one guy who was 
quite outspoken. They, they took him over to Dachau, to the concentration camp, and kept him there for a week, and we came back. We were sort of curious. How is it over there? Because we heard rumors it wasn't a healthy place. And he says, well, if you want to find out, why don't you go? And we never did find out. He, he would rather have been there helping you. <laughs> he much rather hand the ammunition than be there. <laughs> OK, well, you didn't stay on that 88 till the end of the war, though. You entered a combat unit, right? Yeah. We stayed until we went for Munich in December of 1945 at Christmas leave and That's that transfer to Augsburg. Time of the Battle of the Bulge? Yeah. Of course, I don't know why they gave us vacation or why they moved the battery. One reason why they moved the battery is because the German jets were built in Augsburg and that's where they moved us to protect the factory. Oh. Unfortunately, we were so far, our quarters were so far from where the battery was, it took us like 10 minutes to get up there. So every time during the night when the alarm rang, by the time we got up there, it was all over again. It's a stupid thing, like many things during the war. <laughs> I thought the Americans were the only ones that made mistakes. Oh, no. And of course, bureaucracy was big. And then, yeah, then I joined the Infantry Signal Corps outfit. Well, excuse me, let's, let's uh, take a picture of this first. I think this is really interesting, Carl. And, and tell us the uh, history of that book, will you? I forgot the title. Combat he wrote. Anyway, it's written by Lieutenant Colonel Charlie Hudson, a friend of mine from Oxnard, whom I met in 1940, no, 1961 at the shopping center meeting. And I said I was born outside of Munich. And he says, tell me where. And I said, well, you wouldn't know the place. It's a little town. Had an Air Force base as well. Erding. I said, yes. He said, I was there in 1944. I said, no, you were not because you guys didn't come in until May of 1945. He says, well, I flew there. I said, then I shot at you. And in the book, he mentions that I shot at him and I missed him. And he thanked you for that. Yeah, well, he wasn't that great a bombardier, and obviously I was not that good a gunner, so that's why we are still around. Well, just like here, you know, I had several friends here, including uh, Russell Bunderson, who was a B-17 pilot and wanted me to work on a B-17 with him because he saw, he said, you saw the other end. And he always insisted they only flew to Munich sightseeing. And I said, how come you open the bomb base? <laughs> well, that's, that's sure interesting. It's very unique that you, you met a guy that was in your area at the same time you were there. Then, uh, then you the infantry started to tell about the infantry. Yeah, we had basic training in Regensburg, and we were bombed out there. We had to wash up, so we went down to the Danube. This was in March or April. Forty-five. In forty-five. Marched down to the Danube to wash up, which was a little bit chilly, and that's why I caught rheumatism, and eventually caught me. Anyway, we went from there to, what is it called, Wirt. Maybe over here. Yeah, we'll see if we can get a picture of that. There you go, There's good. It's Wirt on the Danube. It's a Carolingian castle. Dates back to, a, part of it dates back to 18, 806 or 814. 814 was Charlemagne. And we were got chased out there. That's where I met Bill Moyer, as a matter of fact. Was he in the same hospital? No, he flew a P-38. Yeah. And he tried to drop a bomber. He no, tried to they strafe tried us. to strafe us. But it was the castle was a horseshoe type thing, and they couldn't get in there. It was too steep to shoot down in there. So they came across the Danube, and there was an opening, which you can see here. There's an opening there. Yeah. And we were behind about a six-foot brick wall. And we watched the P-38s come across the dam and shooting in that way. And we stood there and waved at them until we saw the things flicker up and then we ducked. You have no brains at 16 years. You're just brave. 
as I recall him talking to Bill Moyer, he his P-38s uh, went in ahead of Patton's Third Army uh, for for ground support. Well, Patton chased us up and down the Danube, <coughs> and eventually my cleaning efforts in Regensburg turned into rheumatism, and I ended up in a hospital in Vilshofen. And I do have an old postcard that my dad sent me oh, in 1956. Oh, my goodness. And he was, by that time, he left the fire department and was working for the Custom Palace Association of Bavaria. And he traveled all over Bavaria, and so he knew I was in Schweichelberg. And he sent a card, and we probably can show it. Here we go, there we go. It's the thing up on top. Okay. And that was a monastery, and I was there in the hospital. And, of course, on the 8th of May, it was all over. And the Americans didn't come up for a couple of days because they thought there was SS up in there. And eventually they got up there, and everybody was hiding their watches and their cameras. I was hiding my camera in the attic. A friend of mine helped me. As it turned out, he stole my camera, so he wasn't a friend really. <laughs> and after about five weeks, I guess, I was in good enough shape to be released. And of course, he had to be released to a POW camp in the area. And there were outdoors and tents. And I said, well, if I go, to a, go into a tent, I'm going to have rheumatism again. So I had thrown away my military passport, and I kept my Hitler Youth Pass. So I went down to the sergeant in charge of the hospital, and I said, now, I don't know what I'm doing here. I was in a Hitler Youth, and there is no more Hitler Youth. He says, you're damn right there's no more Hitler Youth. I said, well, then I'm a civilian. He says, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Not the smartest sergeant in the world, but he says, well, then get the hell out of here. And I did. <laughs> That's how it was released. Let me butt in here a little bit, Carl. Something I've always, uh, when we were in Bavaria, we went up to Eagle's Nest, uh -huh. uh, Berchtesgarten, is that what yep. they call it? Why didn't the Allies, particularly the British, ever bomb that? Well, for one thing, it's a very hard thing to hit. It's like hitting the tram station here in Palm Springs. Because it was such a small area. Yeah. Besides, you guys were not all that accurate. <laughs> Sorry to say, neither was I, but... <laughs> well, it probably wasn't that vital anyway. No. He hardly ever was there. He was there before the war and then a, a couple of meetings up there. They said he never slept there overnight. Probably not. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Okay, that's something that <laughs> I've often wondered about is why somebody didn't take that out, but it probably wasn't that important anyway. Well, maybe they wanted to save it. And maybe they did. I don't know what's there now. I think the Eagle's Nest is still there. And the Berghof, which is down below, there's an elevator going up yeah. the last few hundred feet. The Berghof was blown up, and now they're building a hotel there. <laughs> oh, yeah. that elevator was still there when we were there. Mm -hmm. I was never up there. But... Well, okay, I didn't want to interrupt there, but um, so you uh, bailed out of that hospital and talked the sergeant into letting you out, and uh, then what happened? And then I had about a oh. little more than 100 miles home. Now, Filshofen is on the Fils, which is a name of a river. Probably shows here. Uh, there's Vienna. Well, we are in here about 45, uh, right in here. And the Danube goes along here. Mm -hmm. The Fils goes into the Danube. Anyway, the Fils, I knew my aunt next to my uncle, had a farm where the fields originated. So I said, if I follow the fields home, I get to Blumenthal, to my aunt's farm. And I did. Now you could only go about three miles, five k's, where all you were allowed to go. So I stole a rake from a farmer, which I had never returned, <laughs> and told the guys, the GIs along the road, that. I have to work over on that field. So I walked over there and I had another 5Ks to go, and that's how I got home. 
Could, could, could you speak any English then? Well, I had uh, five years of high school English, which wasn't a hell of a lot, but it, it got me by. Uh, I spoke more than... More than they spoke than, German. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> So, uh, so you kind of uh, walked your way home, and then um, you were probably what, 18 years old then, or something like that. Well, let's see, 15. I was 17 when Patton retired me. Uh, 17 then, and I tried to get back into high school, and I had forgotten how to learn. So, I bummed around for a while. Worked for the PX in Munich for a while. Got called caught stealing cigarettes, which the only reason why we worked there, the cigarettes was cash money, and eventually worked for a newspaper. Excuse me, let me add, go back here just a little bit. What, would you, would you want to tell me what your feeling was when the war was over? Terrible. I felt like, ugh. I guess that was a dumb question. I, no, it wasn't a dumb question, but and most people probably say they were relieved that the dictator was gone and all that stuff. But anyway, 80% of them voted, 80% of the people voted for him. So anyway, yeah, I was sad, and it, it was a bad time. But I made it, and like I said, I had a short time at the PX until I got thrown out. Uh, actually, we, they didn't lock us up. They, uh, too much of that stuff went on, I guess. They put us on a big semi and drove us 50 miles out of town into the area that you mentioned near the Kimsey and told us to get off the damn truck and find our way home. That was our lesson. Yes. <laughs> so we didn't steal any cigarettes anymore. So. <laughs> okay, then uh, what led to you coming to the United States? I became an exchange student in... Uh, have to look at it, uh, 53, 53, 54, I went to summer school at Columbia and one year at Cornell, labor relations, where they call us the commies. <laughs> we were supposed to be the left-wing guys at Cornell, labor relations. Oh, As a matter of fact, there was one professor that was in China, famous name. Lat Latimer. His son was a student advisor at Cornell. So anyway, I went to Columbia and Cornell and went back to Germany and my roommate at Cornell came a year later and said, why don't you come back to the States? I said, well, it's further than going from Palm Springs to Desert Hot Springs, you know, it's quite a change. He said, well, I'll sponsor you. My dad will sponsor you. He was too young. And on the way back in 1954, we got off the boat in Lisbon, and we ran into German tourists. And they were loud and noisy and obnoxious, sort of like the ugly American type thing. And I said, I don't want to be part of that stuff anymore. So his offer was enticing, and I came in 1950. I have to look at it. 56 to the U.S. to Elmira, New York. Worked a number of things there. Worked at Remington Rand, where they built the Norton bomb site. Yeah. <coughs> we were building typewriter cases typewriters and adding machines. <coughs> I got a frog in my mouth. And eventually went back to my newspaper business, started on a weekly newspaper in hmm, outside of Corning, okay. Addison, New York, and eventually Wayland, New York, and then the industry went down and we advertised in a trade publication looking for work, got an answer from Santa Paula, and he offered us a good job. I was going to be advertising manager, and he had eight weekly newspapers, and I didn't trust the weekly publisher, so I asked him what kind of equipment he had, and he sent us a list of the equipment, 
We sold everything in, in Oxnard, in Wayland, and drove from Wayland to San Francisco, looked up a friend of mine there, who was an exchange student with me back in 53, and drove down the coast highway to Oxnard, actually Santa Paula. And I had done that once before, during my exchange student time at the end, I hitchhiked cross country from New Jersey to San Francisco to New Orleans and back up to New Hampshire. Wow. 8,900 miles and I still got the map at home. That's quite a trip. Yeah. How long did that take you? About six weeks. That's a pretty good time. Oh yeah. And I had, had good rides and quite some long rides. And I smoked at the time. I still smoke a little bit, but at that time I was a smoker. And I didn't all I had was one pack of cigarettes and one ride I got outside of New Orleans, about a couple of hundred miles from New Orleans. Catholic priest picked me up and had my last cigarette. I says, you smoke? He says, no. And you don't either, not in my car. <laughs> <laughs> he was the boss. Yeah. <laughs> so you spent most of your time then around Oxnard? <clears throat> and we were three weeks in Santa Paula and found out that the equipment was all in storage. Oh. All he had was an old flatbed press and no no business. I went out, sold my first full page grocery ad and the guy says, now this is going to be in the, whatever the daily newspaper was in Santa Paula. I said, no, it's the other one, the weekly. I'll get lost. So, this is not a smart move. I, we came 3,500 miles cross country and we have no newspaper. So I went to the daily newspaper to find out if they had a job there, hung around the back door until somebody came out and says, got an opening? He says, no, but I know Oxnard has an opening. So I went down to Oxnard, weekly newspaper, we only had to work a couple of days. Yeah. And the rest you were out soliciting, which didn't work out that well. Went down to Oxnard, got my job. Almost didn't because I walked in short sleeve. Santa Ana's were blowing. And I said, well, this is Southern California. They don't need a jacket. And they almost didn't get a job because they didn't have a jacket on. What, did they have photo offset printing there? No, we were still letterpress then. Still setting that uh, linotype? Hot type. Linotypes, yeah. You know how to do that? No, but my wife is a linotype operator. I should probably should mention her because Otherwise, I wouldn't be here and be retired for 23 years now. I'm 73 now, so I've been retired for 23. We both retired at 50. We bought some income property over the years in Oxnard. And at 50, we found out that Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, we were working for the government, and only Thursday and Friday was ours. We didn't think that was a smart idea. That's America. Uh -huh. Of course, in Elmira, I always thought, I just want to make enough money so I have to pay income tax. <laughs> and that turned around in a hurry. But your wife knew how to run a linotype. She ran a linotype in a weekly newspaper in Horseheads, New York, which only golfers know because of, uh, I forgot his name too. Anyway, the famous golfer comes from Horseheads. And Joey Sindelar. That's oh, yeah? Now, where, where are we now? Well, we were, uh, you had just gotten this job uh, on this. On the, on the daily newspaper, yeah. I was salesman and then classified manager and then advertising director. And I had 23 people working under me and Two people worked and 22 were sick or on something and I didn't like it anymore. And I said, I want to go back into sales. And they said, you can't go back into sales, you're management now, <laughs> which happened to me in Munich. And I said, the hell with it, I quit. And well, like I said, we also looked at our financial thing and I said, well, it doesn't pay. At 50, we figured you're still young enough to go back into the economy if it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. We had seven duplexes. And so far it has worked, and I don't know if it works another 10 years, I don't worry. <laughs> well, you invested pretty wisely if you were able to buy 
seven duplexes. Well, you know, you paid down a couple of hundred dollars and, and, and the mortgage we had, well, yeah, 12 or 13 mortgages, <laughs> which didn't worry me. And after the third mortgage, I figured it's the bank term to worry, <laughs> not mine. So those are still uh, earning a little income for you over there? Well, we sold the last one, I think, a year, of, a year ago or so. Now we invested it, and one of them is still being paid off. Then we gave two to St. John's Hospital, because that's the only way you can keep money here is to give it away. And then you have a write-off. And, and so that works with the real estate thing. And then we, came, we bought the house in Palm Springs about 16 years ago. And we used the guest quarters and rented the main house. And then a few years ago, a few years later, <laughs> 70 years ago, it didn't rent so well anymore. We didn't allow dogs because I had to do all the yard work and I didn't want to mess with that stuff. So I said, well, we're supposed to be retired anyway. Let's move to Palm Springs. And we did. And we came to Palm Springs uh, full time six, seven years ago. And we just heard about the B-17 and Bob Pond, and they had an office downtown on Indian. And we walked down there, and they were bringing some airplanes from Minneapolis, from probably. here, downtown. Oh. And we offered to, to walk the airplanes. No, that wasn't, that was not, that was later. Anyway, we said we were interested, and we didn't hear from them, so the following year, I guess, we kept on going. And eventually we joined in August, five years ago. And we met at John Wagaman's house over in either Rancho Mirage or Indian Wells, healthy area over there. We had the first meetings over there. We were only about 10 or 12 people. And we were the first ones. And I still got my five stars. So you're one of the original ones. Uh -huh. There are only about five or six guys left that have been longer with the museum than we have. Well, Bob Pond is still around. Yep. He's only four years older than I am. Oh. His Navy pass is somewhere down in the display cases. Yeah, I, 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 I know where 1924. Yeah. Okay. So we yeah. came to the museum and we took half a year of training, and my wife worked the European hangar, and I worked the Navy hangar because I knew nothing about the Pacific. And I figured that was interesting to learn something about. Besides, I figured they wouldn't let me in on the other side anyway, since I shot at those guys. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I never saw a Navy plane in, in Munich or Augsburg. You know, they didn't fly that far. So, excuse me, what is your wife's name, Carl? Oh, that's Virginia. Also known as the treasurer and the boss. And she worked in the Army. Your Army or European hangar, I guess they refer to it. Yeah. Okay, do you have any children? <clears throat> have one, Carla, who is either 43 or 44. Must be 43 because we've been married 44. <laughs> one of those rare things that worked. <laughs> <laughs> what does he do? Uh, she worked. She, she doesn't work in an office. She, she hates indoors. So she wanted to be an actress. That didn't work. So she worked part time in Hollywood. She worked, what's a fancy store down there? Jewelry store. Huh. Anyway, then she ended up on a fishing boat in a Bering Sea, handling fishing equipment. It's quite a difference in working in a jewelry store. Uh -huh. <coughs> well, she bookkeeping, all kinds of things, as long as it wasn't eight to five. And eventually she got married. Her husband is still at sea, about five, six months out of the year. And she's married, of course, now, and five years now, or six, and lives in Sisters, Oregon, which is central Oregon, near Bend and Redmond. Would, right there. would that be? Carla, K-A-R-L-A? That is Carla, K-A-R-L-A. Well, that's interesting. Well, what else have you got to tell us? Well, like I said, I enjoyed working at the museum. Number one, you meet a lot of people. 
I was one of the few German-speaking guys. I'm the only anti-aircraft gunner. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I met nice, friendly guys, and just because I shot at them, we actually never shot at people. That was a funny thing. Uh, yeah. Russell Bunderson said, you know, people down there, you were a target. And I said, well, you were an airplane. We shot at airplanes. Yeah, it's a little different than in the infantry. Not quite as personal, yeah. I guess. Well, infantry, you know, supposedly you shoot at people. Well, in World War One, they spent 1.2 million rounds of ammunition to kill one person, which is not very cost effective. No, it is. We're very accurate. <laughs> well, neither was the B-17, as a matter of fact. They no. carried 3,000 pounds of bomb with 10 people. And when one blew up, you lost 10 people and 3,000 pounds, and sometimes not even that much. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we had a good time, but some stuff I didn't agree, and I don't run the museum. So besides, three and a half years, every Monday, all day long, is a long time. So maybe I'll come back again someday, but not at the moment. Well, we're, we can probably wind this up here then, Carl. I'm going to give you a a copy of the tape right now, and then uh, go downstairs and get okay. a different camera, get a shot of that mighty 88. How's okay. That? Uh, should we do, well, I basically talked about what the crew was doing anyway. We had, I guess, about nine that were on the gun. I'll point out down there. Yeah, sure. it. <coughs> You gave me a little bit of that information here, but we're going to get a better audio up here because it's going to be windy okay. down there. And so anything else you want to say about the artillery piece, uh, better say it here and then we'll... Uh... Well, for one thing, the barrel should be elevated. It's at parade rest right now. That's what, it should uh, be up. That's what Pappas said. He said that, that barrel ought to be elevated. And then somebody suggested it should be pointed across the street at the newspaper, <laughs> which I object to since I have stocking a net. <laughs> well, the US Nobody likes the local newspaper, no matter where you live. Well, firing that many rounds a minute, 24 to 26 rounds a minute, uh, that, that barrel had to get pretty hot. As a matter of fact, we had one that exploded in a barrel. And we didn't know. We were busy, you know. Yeah. We were busy, and yet, at the same time, we always looked up to watch the airplanes, which wasn't no big deal, because, number one, a lot of them had the condensed typhoon vapor tails. And usually, you saw about somewhere between 300 and 800 airplanes, so lots to watch. And they told us, watch your dial, watch your dial, you know. As a matter of fact, our, what do you call it, rangefinder, we were told in the middle of 44, we got an airplane that's too fast and we are not supposed to see it, so if a real fast airplane comes, you're not supposed to pick it up. And we were 16 years old, and somebody says, don't do it, you have to, you, why not? And they picked up an ME-262. I saw you get knocked on a couple of those. No, we or, shot uh, missiles. Oh. A couple of 109s you got. Three 109s and one JU-88. Uh, the 109s uh, were on a delivery flight from Augsburg, which means 40 miles they had on their speedometer. And they came in low, unannounced, to land on the field behind us in Oberschleißheim. And we had a rule, low flying airplanes means you're getting strafed. So about a thousand yards out, we had little cards marked, the woods in the back, and try to get three rounds off, and maybe you get them. Well, they came in low, we fired our three rounds, we got all three of them, we didn't kill them, we ruined the airplanes, they barely landed at the field, two or three miles away, jumped in a staff car and came to our battery and raised holy hell with our battery command. Well, he gets chewed out because we shot down our own airplanes. After about 20 minutes, they left. 
first lieutenant, what's an Oberleutnant? It's a, the higher kind of a lieutenant. I never learned the difference. First and second lieutenant. What's who is the highest one? The first or the second? It's the first lieutenant. Okay. Higher. First lieutenant came over, and we were painting rings around our barrel. This was, you know, for kills. I says, "What are you guys doing? Painting rings? Three kills?" He says, "Guys, that was our own airplanes." And one of our guys said, "Skill is skill, sir." <laughs> did the Germans have? Did you have radar? We had radar, but we hardly ever used it. It didn't work all that well. We used our optical range finder more than the radar. But they came in unannounced. They, they never should have been there. No. Well, they were on the delivery flight. It was none of our business as far as they were concerned. Besides, they were civilian pilots. Or, I don't know, maybe just transporting pilots. As a matter of fact, I was reading a book and it has nothing to do with it, but they had a women's WASP, women's air force, and flew delivery flights yeah. from a factory. Mostly system. transports. Yeah. The first woman that flew a P-47, was the first fighter airplane that they flew, was here in Palm Springs because of Jack and Cochran had the ranch down there. Yeah. And she came out here to visit her and they flew planes from Long Beach and LA out here, refueled them and then flew them out. And, okay. I got off that. Yeah, that's 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 quite interesting. Um, anything else about the 88 before we go out there? Okay, I said the range was uh, we could shoot to 30,000 feet, but we were not accurate, quote unquote, <laughs> to over 25,000 feet. And the P-17s and 24s came in usually about 20 to 24,000 feet, so that was within our range. And when I said, you know, we could get 26, 28 rounds off a minute, well, we had to, because he only had so much range. The range of the gun was 10 kilometers, which would be about eight miles, seven miles. Now they came in, all information, you could get them about a mile and a half out, over you, and they're gone. You didn't have very long. You didn't have much time. And we fired as many as 340 rounds in one attack. And we had one shell that exploded in a barrel. We didn't know until the loading guy who slapped it in looked up and said, oh, short barrel. <laughs> when, when those rounds exploded, how big a pattern did they? I don't know. I never was up there. <laughs> uh, I would say the size of probably out the area, 40 feet. That, that big a pattern. Yeah. And of course, B-17 would take a lot of damage. Yeah, it did. 17, uh, 24s were easier. They, they blew up faster. As a matter of fact, somebody said a lot of them blew up because we were smoking inside and there was leaking gas and that's why a bunch of them blew up. So we probably would have made her off to send cigarettes to England instead of trying to shoot them down. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carl, let's go outside okay. and, and see if we can get a picture of that artillery piece. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. You said you're going back to... Okay, now we're outside here by the... Uh... <coughs> 88 millimeter anti-aircraft piece, and Carl's going to describe his workings with this gun and uh, everything about it that we can show you here on the video. Go ahead, Carl. Okay. This is the 88 millimeter gun. We have several positions here. This is where the information came from the rangefinder. It was sent electronically. <coughs> this thing moved around you match the mirror with this one in here. That's all you had to do. It would have been easier to use monkeys. <laughs> but we only had about 20 monkeys in the zoo in Munich and about 2,000 students, so it was easier to use us than the monkeys. <laughs> this is the K1 position that handles the elevation of the gun barrel, which really should be up, but that's where it goes. And it should be pointed over there at the Gannett newspaper, but anyway. K1. That's the elevation. K2 
pay to get the seat. This one he had to walk around. This one had a seat here. This K2, it does the sideways movement. And then we have to go over on the other side. Sitting up here was the K6. What he did was, again, he had the dial here. And the shells went in here. They were all hand loaded. Hand loaded. The guys got it out of the four corners of the battery, uh, of the gun emplacement, brought it over here, stuck it in there, and this one determined the time when it would explode. There was a time fuse. Oh, yeah? And from here, this was this was a K6. From here, the loading gunner would take it out, get it in a barrel, and he had a big leather cuff because that thing would close real quick, so you would catch your finger. So you had a big heavy cuff, slap it in, and then pull a cord, and off it went. Uh, how could he load that 23, 24, 25 times a minute? That heaver is really busy. Uh -huh. He was a tired pup afterwards. Yes. Now, you were K1. Where was your uh, position over here on the other side? This was over here, yeah. Where the little paper thing hangs <laughs> that tells you not to climb on a gun, I guess. That's what it says. Uh, anyway, that was my stop here, K1. And, well, we had the ammunition carriers and then the gun leader, which usually was a non com officer, corporal, I guess. And that was it. Kids, kids handled that gun. And it was quite effective. Now, this one is mobile, but you said yours was stationary. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we didn't even have the side arms here. This way you could go out in the field and you could actually fire the gun just the way it stands right now. Without putting the downriggers down? Yeah. Is that right? If necessary. Didn't have that much of a recoil. The recoil went back there, so it was not that bad. But normally you would take this stuff, the wheels off, and put it down here. And if you had a regular battery like where we were, uh, they would take this off too and just mount it on the concrete base. Now you told me that there are only 3,000 of these made and this one was made in, in, in France. France. There is some way, a, I guess it's in here. Yep. Canon D88. Right in here. I don't know if I can get that. 1944. Point, point at it again, will you, Carl? Right in here. Okay, okay, I got there it. There was an area in France, Clermont, something like that, French uh, ammunition center, just like the Ruhr Valley in Germany. And they made weapons, and I, by 1944, they made some for us. Not very long, because June 6th, they went down the train then. Yeah, I, I'm getting that. That's that's really interesting. Yeah. Canon D88-56. I don't know what the 56 stands That would have been the Vichy French that uh -huh. built that. Probably. Now, this one doesn't have what's in there. A breach? Is that what they call it? The thing in there? Yeah. Okay. It doesn't have a breach because you cannot have a gun here with a breach. I guess the government still doesn't trust us. <laughs> for a very good reason. But that's my old 88, all right. Well, you just stand there and we'll get a last shot of that, Carl. I, I, I have to back up a little bit because... Yeah, I didn't get the whole gun before because I... Yeah, because you do have a barrel. 
<laughs> yeah, otherwise I couldn't have heard you talk. Okay, thanks, Carl.